Hello everyone, my name is Eric Jones and we're going to look at a lecture entitled Introduction to Landscape Management. It's a, it's a course that I use uh, to introduce my students at the community college I teach at to what is landscape management. This course has been approved by the North Carolina Landscape Licensing Board and the actual uh, uh, course number is CEL398. And again, I'm Eric Jones and to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, I grew up in the landscape uh, industry. My parents owned Elite Landscape Service and Nursery uh, right outside of Winston-Salem. So from a very small age, I was always in the nursery, you know, working uh, with the plant materials. And then my parents expanded into what is now called landscape management and uh, grew up, uh, you know, cutting lawns through the summer. You know, my parents would even pick me and my brother up at school. Uh, take us to various job sites, and we would work uh, every afternoon. Um, graduated high school, uh, joined the Navy uh, for a little bit of time, had had some fun doing that, went to college, um, started off with a computer science degree, but soon switched uh, from my sophomore year uh, to landscape architecture, and I've uh, uh, since been doing that uh, since graduation well when i graduated i did continue to help my parents for about 10 years uh, and then uh, decided to join the army so i've had some various uh, military experience did that as a midlife crisis and while i was on active duty actually uh, applied uh, for a position uh, teaching horticulture at a community college so and i've been here for about uh, six years now and truly love it truly love the landscape industry uh, and the people that are associated with it. So thank you for taking this course. Uh, I've been teaching online classes for the Irrigation Board for several years now, and, and uh, since the, uh, the Landscape Licensing Board are requiring us to, to do CEUs, um, I thought I would um, uh, apply and get these courses. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, this is Introduction to Landscape Management. I know this is going to be a repeat for a lot of you guys that have been in the profession for uh, longer than I have probably. So um, the good thing about this horticulture business industry, the green industry that we're in, there's not one person that knows every single thing about, about the industry. I learn something new every day. I learn something new from my colleagues. I learn, actually learn from my students. I learn from teaching every day. This industry is so widespread and broad that, that it's hard to know every single thing. So I can learn from you guys and hopefully you guys will uh, will learn from me. But let's go ahead and get started on this. This is Intro to Landscape Management. So what is landscape management? In this, you could probably get several different um, definitions from it. Me, I like calling myself a landscape manager. I don't like using the term landscape maintenance uh, for one, the, the term management sets us apart. It sounds like that we're a professional, um, a professional industry. We're we're providing a management services. We're we're not just cutting grass. Well, get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with cutting grass. You can make a ton of money cutting grass, especially if you find that niche market and you focus on those certain aspects of mowing you can make a lot of money i've always said monotonous work makes you money and so if your crews are going out and cutting grass every single day you're going to make some profit but landscape management is a whole wide array of managing a property all the way from the irrigation system to cutting the grass to the turf care management to the shrub management to the pruning the trees the whole aspects of it. And what I usually typically have my students do is we do a landscape management plan for a property and we do that in the spring semester uh, each year. And it's a really good project. The students, they take pictures, they actually get the geodata maps, uh, they'll actually draw maps, and they know this property inside and out. And what they do is they do a 12 month calendar plan for the property and that's basically uh, what their plan consists of it is really just a schedule with pricing and it's a list of services that we are going to provide and with landscape management sometimes you may not sometimes you may not actually um, do work 
for people. You can actually provide a landscape management plan for a client and actually never do the work yourself. You could actually sell the landscape management plan as a service that you can offer clients. And management sometimes means that you won't apply pesticides. You may integrate an integrated pest management plan. You you may just certain things. So you've got to get to know the property and there's not one particular plan that fits all properties. It actually is custom tailored for each for each site that you do it. So landscape management is a profession and that's the term I like using. We are professional people working for clients. Just because we're blue collared workers does not mean that we're not educated, that we're not trained, that we're not getting CEUs, that we're not licensed. Um, we've got insurance. We've, we've, got, we've got everything else that um, other professional um, people have. You know, CPAs, doctors, yeah, they might have a little, little more uh, liability insurance than we do, but look at everything that we have to do uh, just to work. Our workers' comp, our general liability, all of that is expensive, and it's part of our profession, and that if you are a professional, you need to have it. Our biggest downfall is that we have landscape companies out there who do not do it the correct way, that are operating without the insurance, that are operating without the license, that are operating without the bond, that are fly-by-nighters. And it's so easy to get into this business that is why we're getting hurt. And I almost wish that the license was a little more stricter, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to get into that. But we are a profession, and we've got to look at ourselves as professional people. It is also an art. We're actually maintaining properties and, and bringing them to life and making them beautiful. You know, my dad's motto is, you know, we beautify the outdoors. It's an art. It's also a science. It's a science because look at the technology behind it. Look at the, the pesticides that we use. Look at the irrigation systems that we design and install. Look at everything that we do for a property. It is a science. Just knowing the plant materials is a science in itself and actually giving the plants the correct water, the correct food, all of it is a science. And last but not least, it is also a business. And this is where a lot of us mess up. We're so busy working in our business that we're not working on our business. And we kind of let the paperwork slide to the end. We get behind in our billing. We get behind uh, in our estimates. We get behind in returning phone calls because we're so busy working in the business, not on it. And we've got to actually really sit down and look at all four aspects of of this landscape management system. Take it seriously. We are a profession. Act like professionals. We're providing art. We are beautifying the outdoors. And we're technically savvy when it comes to the science behind our industry. And then, again, the business end. Make sure that Make sure you don't let this fall to the to the wayside. I know we all wear many hats. You know we're we're the grass cutter today. We're the installer tomorrow. We're the the bookkeeper at night. We're the estimator early in the mornings. We've got to make sure that 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 we focus on the business end, or we grow our business that we can actually hire some of this done. And that's that's always the hardest thing to do is when you get. Um, to that point where you're having to hire people to do estimates for you and do the billing, you, you kind of lose a little bit of control and that's, that's hard for us to do. And it's always the hardest million dollars you make in sales is your toughest. You know, the second is, is, is much easier, much quicker to do than, than obtaining that first uh, dollar amount of a million bucks a year in sales. So, um, again, I get long and I get drawn out and, You'll see me get excited with this. So let's we'll stick to to landscape management here. But the landscape manager, we know plants and we know turf. We we should anyway. Um, it's hard to know every single plant out there. Um, I mean, there's plants that that I come across that I have to look up and see what it is. But we should all in this area, North Carolina especially, we should all be familiar with the North Carolina Certified Plant List or become a certified plant professional. 
uh, as, as well as be a licensed landscape contractor. We need to know those plant material. We need to, we're going to identify and control pests, whether it be on turf, whether it be uh, on our plant material. We need to understand the chemicals, the soils, and plant nutrition. And again, remember, we're going back to this is a science, and this is, this is hard science. Some of the uh, two of our hardest classes we teach at the community college is plant science and soil science. And if our students can get past those two classes, they're, they're going to do well in the program. We get to work with some of the coolest equipment around, the different types of lawnmowers, the different types of tractors, skid steers, the dingoes, the stand-up, ride-ons. I mean, we, we have a wide array of equipment that we get to use. And we need to know how to grow an ever-expanding list of plants. Again, be familiar with the certified plant professional list, but also be open to, uh, to other plants that, um, that you come across. You need to, to expand that list every single day. Try to learn one or two plants, new plants a week. Um, we also have to direct and supervise employees. Probably the hardest thing that we ever have to do as a landscape manager. It's easy working with plants. It's easy working with grass. We know how to take care of that. But we're, when we start dealing with people, it gets to be uh, a little tough, and especially in this industry. I don't, I don't understand what it is. You know, I've worked with my parents when they had 30-plus employees, and I've worked with them when they had one or two employees. Um, and it really seems harder the, the fewer employees you have. Um, these are the ones that are going to lay out. You know, they show up on a rainy on a rainy Monday morning wanting to work, uh, but they're going to lay out on a Friday that's beautiful and sunny. I mean, it's you know you deal with that stuff all the time. So you got to be a good pe people person to to be a landscape manager. You need to be able to manage budget and keep the business afloat. You can't rob Peter to pay Paul. You can do that for two years, and that's what my accountants always told us. You can run on negative cash flow for two years, but at the end of that two years, it's going to stop. It's done. It's over with. We deal with owners, clients, sales representatives from the chemical companies or grass seed companies. We're, we're dealing with, with people all the time. Then we have to deal with taxes, regulation, and government mandates. And that is something you got to stay on top of. You get a large enough payroll that you're making weekly tax deposits at the bank on Fridays. You know, can be a good thing that you're making that, that much money, but if you get behind in your billing and you don't have it set up where, um, you know, the cash flow is coming in, you can get in trouble pretty quick. The IRS will knock on that door quicker than anything is, is, is when you miss uh, those tax deposits. And I think the funnest thing about being in this business is marketing. And we have to be a marketing genius. And with today's uh, social media, that's where we need to be focusing uh our marketing concentrations. Yes, it's great to have a website. People want to go to your website and see pictures and stuff. But I think more importantly than websites is um, your social media, your Facebook, your Instagram, your Twitter. Um, I like Twitter basically uh, just because I can keep up with other landscape companies. I can keep up with the, the sales representatives from, from the uh, seed companies or the fertilized companies. I get a lot of information just from Twitter. I'm not really using it to market my company, but I'm using it as an educational tool for myself. But when it comes to Facebook and Twitter, I mean, uh, Facebook and Instagram and even Snapchat, I am really uh, focused uh, on marketing that, especially for my dad's company. He does, the, you know, we have Jones Strawberry Farm. His sole uh, marketing uh, program is through Facebook, is through Snapchat. I mean, he's putting pictures up every single day of people picking strawberries, of the jam that we make, the uh, um, the strawberry salsa that we make. I mean, all of that is put on Facebook, and people people come to it. And the best thing about it, you put these these logos on your business card, you put them on your truck. And voila, you are a marketing genius. So within landscape management, many books, uh, there are many books about the nuts and bolts of plants and turf, but there are really not really many books that have treated landscape management as a business or even mentioned the word profit. 
And as you've seen on the opening screen, I use the, uh, the book Professional Landscape Management by David Hensley. I use that in a couple classes that we teach at the, at the college. So uh, very, very good book. I highly recommend picking up a copy of it uh, if you can, ordering it through Amazon or, or um, finding it in the bookstore. So um, a lot of the information I get is from, from that book. Um, and um, uh, we use it in the college, like I said, all the time. Landscape managers must deal with developing and maintaining the landscape as a sum of all its parts. And again, like I said, it's not just mowing. It's not just fertilizing. You have to take all of this together and see that it is interrelated uh, as a whole. And as a landscape management professional, um, I want to be the sole person doing the work for the property. I don't want to mow somebody's lawn and take care of their shrubs unless I have control of the irrigation system. I don't even want the homeowner to have control of the irrigation system. I want to be able to set the controller have my guys be able to check the controller when they get there. If, it, if the yard's too wet, have them, you know, reduce the water. If it's too dry, have them increase it. I don't want to have to depend on the irrigation company coming out to do it or letting the homeowner know. I'm in total control. If I'm also mowing the property and taking care of the plants, I don't want a lawn care company doing the fertilizing. I want to do it all. Now, there's nothing wrong with me being the landscape manager, maybe subcontracting this out, but I do not want the homeowner to have multiple companies taking care of issues on their property. If I'm going to be their landscape management company, I'm going to have control of the irrigation, the fertilize, the pine needles, when things are pruned. I'm not going to, I'm not going to have the hassle of somebody else coming to do that because we've had instances where uh, we were mowing the property, and we were pine needling, we were um, fertilizing, plugging and seeding, and things of that nature. But we'd have another horticulturalist come in and want to do the pruning or want to come in and do little gardening things. And there was always bickering. There was always, you know, some issues brought up. So I'm not going to look after a property unless I, unless I have total control. But again... I will tell you it's okay to use subcontractors. And again, I kind of look at landscape management uh, and even landscape installation and um, you know landscape design. We can be the clipboard builder. And when I say clipboard builder, that means we can be the individual who, again, is a professional, who is an artist, who is a scientist, and a businessman or businesswoman manage the property and not touch a thing on it themselves. You can subcontract a lot of this stuff out and actually be the total manager. There's two ways to run your landscape management company. You're doing the work, you have crews that do it, or you can be that clipboard builder. And I, and I say clipboard builder because, you know, we're all associated with home builders and, and I, I had a general contractor license for, for about eight years. And I see a lot of home builders that they get out of the, the truck and they're wearing khakis and a polo shirt. They they never pick up a hammer. They never pick up a nail. They are the clipboard builder. They're they're running the project. And as a landscape contractor, you can do that as well. So I look at it as two sides. You have this huge company that you're doing all this work, or it can be just yourself and you're subbing a lot of the work out. But Whenever it comes to managing somebody's property, make sure that you have control of all aspects, uh, aspects of the property. So, again, the landscape management for an introduction is the art, science, and skill employed by professionals who maintain all or any part of the exterior environment. Good definition there that's taken directly from, from that textbook. So management versus maintenance. Again, I just I don't like the word maintenance. Um, 
you know, management describes the responsibilities that we have. It states that we are in a management position, maintenance. It just feels like we're the guys out there um, that have a job cutting grass because we can't do anything else. So I always tell my students from day one, you know, we're not in the maintenance business. We're in the management business. We're landscape managers running a landscape management business and just drop the term maintenance altogether. You know, uh, if you're going to do fertility apps and, and, and do uh, fertilization, I call that lawn care. Landscape management encompasses the whole property. You're the landscape manager. You're making sure the turf is mowed, fertilized, plugged and seeded. You're making sure that the plants get fertilized, pruned when they need to. Uh, and a big, big thing when it comes to pruning is these guys come in with hedge clippers and they cut it all in the same month, you know, or the same week. They cut every single thing. As a landscape manager, you've got to come up with a pruning schedule that's going to prune the, the plants when they need to be pruned. Don't prune your azaleas the same time you're going to prune your hollies. You need to prune the azaleas shortly after they bloom so that they bloom again the following year. And you don't need to do it with hedge clippers. So a manager is going to sit down and actually come up with a pruning calendar for their clients. And that is a responsibility that we have. The true landscape supervisor is also a manager of people, time, equipment, and money. And again, probably two of the biggest things, hardest things we're going to have to deal with is people and money because people is associated with money. You're going to have trouble with your employees showing up on time, showing up, and showing up when it's pouring down rain. You're going to miss the sunny days, as I said earlier. But finding the right people to work for you. And being able to to pay them enough for them to stick around uh, is always going to be an issue. And then money, chasing down your money. I don't know how many times I've seen my dad have to do that. Um, you know, paydays coming up. We paid on Mondays. We never paid on Fridays. I mean, he did years ago, but he realized that um, if he paid on Friday, people would take a, a three-day weekend and not show up on Mondays. So when we started showing uh, paying on Mondays. They at least were out on Tuesday. We had them uh, for the start of the week, and we needed to uh, to, to get them there and get, get the week started. They took off on a Tuesday. You know, it's better than them uh, missing a Monday or missing a Saturday because we were, you know, six days a week. We cut uh, a lot of schools uh, that, we, that we did cut the grass on Saturday. So if we paid on Friday, they went out Friday night. You know, we were always shorthanded cutting the schools that in our contract stated we had to cut on Saturdays. So management of people, time, equipment, money. Um, time's pretty, pretty simple to manage and our equipment's uh, pretty simple to manage, especially uh, if we're having uh, a maintenance schedule for our equipment, doing the preventative maintenance, changing the oil, sharpening the blades. If we're doing that on a routine schedule, that's easy to do. I always recommend having, you know, a shop foreman or a guy that actually does that for you. We like to use in retirees, uh, especially guys that, you know, retired, you know, mid fifties, you know, they went to work for a company right out of high school and they retired at 30 years. They were looking for something to do. They were some of our best employees to come in in the evenings after the guys get in and then hang out in the shop, change the oil, sharpen blades, make sure the truck was ready to go. So when the crews came in that morning, it was swipe the time card and they were in the truck and off and running. So the history of landscape management. In the earlier times, um, you always had an apprentice that actually worked for a head gardener or superintendent. Uh, and usually this gardener, he would work for the, for the same estate for his entire life. Uh, and he would actually pass on the work to his sons. And I actually have an uncle that, that very similar to this. Uh, he was a superintendent of the farm. And he worked for the family uh, for quite some time. Uh, he worked as a child because his parents did the same thing, his father. And it was passed down to him. 
and he was given a house by the family, but he took care of the horses, he took care of the cows, he took care of the whole property, and he was part of the family. He was a paid employee, and um, uh, you know did that for 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 his whole life. But in even earlier times, you had the uh, the the head gardener that would that would work for these these estates his whole life, and then uh, you know typically his son would possibly uh, take over. And Adam, who was dating Eve, was possibly the first landscape maintenance contractor to be fired off of the job. And I just threw that in there for, uh, for, uh, for some giggles. And actually, it was from our textbook. But there was a decline in the private gardens in the United States and Europe in the 30s due to the Depression and this so-called thing called inheritance tax. So you've seen a lot of these private gardens disappear. But before we get into what I was getting ready to say, we have some questions for thought. When do you think the landscape management industry, as we know it, was born? And what helped get it started? So think about it. There was a decline in private gardens in the 30s uh, because of the Depression. But what really got it going? Was it World War II? What was it? Well, it was post-war 1940s. So... After World War II, we had improved wages, we had financing opportunities through the GI Bill, and government agencies were helping people get, uh, get money. So, people had a little bit of money, they had the GI Bill, they were coming home from the, from the war, and they wanted to have nice yards. They wanted to have uh, a place to play outside. So... We've seen a major growth in the 60s, uh, after you know, post World War II. Um, that GI Bill really helped people buy the homes, um, uh, go to college, get better jobs. They were able to have have some yard, have a landscape with their house, um, and so they used that. And then in the 60s. We've seen a major growth in the landscape industry. And it really came of age in the 70s and 80s. And all this was due to increases in, in income. People had more leisure time and they wanted to do recreational activities. And also, we started seeing more two household incomes. So that means there was more money for the couples, for the man and wife, and there was less time. And when both mom and dad were working and they come home in the evenings and they were off on the weekends. They had a little extra money, so they were putting it in their yards. They were putting it into their landscapes and they wanted to be outside. They they were in the factories. They were in the office buildings all week. They wanted to be outside and they wanted their yards um, to look really nice. Um, and I know these numbers have changed, guys, because I wrote this PowerPoint actually a couple of years ago. Um, so not, I know a lot of this has changed, but based on when we wrote this, you know, over 50 million acres of managed turf grass and the average national home loan is right at a third of an acre. So, um, you know, and being an average, you know, there's some smaller. And I'll tell you what, my favorite type of property to take care of is the postage stamp lot. I love these vinyl siding neighborhoods and let me explain why because I promise you monotonous work makes you money. If your crew does the same thing day in day out over and over and over again you're gonna make money and I'm talking about your crews I'm not talking about yourself um, but to go into these postage lot stamp neighborhoods, you know, small house, vinyl side and the garage is in the front, so they got short driveway. You go to these neighborhoods, you park the truck all day. Your crews work there all day. And you'll see guys trying to get maybe 35 bucks to cut these yards. You can't do that on the postage lot stamps. 
I would rather cut five of these yards and be able to do them good and do them in an hour and charge 20 bucks. And so if I'm making a hundred bucks an hour off of a two man crew, you know, you got a guy running the mower, the other guy's weed eating and blowing and they're spending less than 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes per lawn. And that's mow, blow and go. Maybe spray a few weeds. If you spray the weeds, charge a little more. But I love sending the crew in to one of these neighborhoods that has hundreds of houses and they cut each lawn for 20 bucks. You're not going to get every single one, but the truck stays in that neighborhood all day or at least most of the day. And if you can make 100 bucks an hour, you know, 50 bucks per man, you, you're going to make some money. And I, I love those type of yards. You got one mower on the truck. You got a couple weed eaters and a blower, maybe a spray can. Very small investment to uh, to make good money. Um, and again, that's just my favorite. Of course, everybody likes cutting the the beautiful yards and uh, the high end ritzy neighborhoods. There's nothing wrong with those too. But my favorite is those twenty dollar uh, yards um, that you can make some money. Also, television guys, still talking about history. Uh, added to the boom of the landscape management services. People come home, they see, you know, HGTV, they see all these new landscape ideas, they see these wonderful backyards and these elegant front yard vistas that people love having. And all these shows have, have boosted it. And we've got to see this because cable TV and satellite TV, you didn't see them growing up. Uh, well, I didn't see them growing up when, when we had, you know, the rabbit ears, where we had the antenna on the house. You know, we had like three channels. And those were your local channels. Maybe you would see a home and garden show on Saturday afternoon or something after the cartoons. But, um, you know, there was no such thing as cable. I didn't get, we didn't get cable until I was in high school. And, or, or, or it might have been last year in middle school. And you started starting to see home and garden TV or uh, other home improvement stations that, that people that people started watching. And that really helped the landscape industry. It also helped home remodeling and helped the, you know, the whole, the whole industry or, you know, the service industry uh, as a whole uh, increase their sales. Franchises and con uh, consolidation. Uh, mixed emotions about this. We were a part of a franchise at one time. Uh, we bought a, a Christmas decor franchise and we ran it uh, for 10 years, made good money at it, uh, but it was time to, to move on. Um, um, we, Dad finished up with the uh, Christmas decor about the time that I uh, uh, left them and, and, and went home. I, I, I was a home builder uh, for almost eight years uh, when the market was good. And when the market kind of fell apart, that's when I when I joined the army, um, and uh, then started teaching school. So things happen for reasons. It was a uh, great experience. I have uh, there's not one thing I would change uh, about my life. So you know I've made some mistakes and I've learned from them. So uh, and I, I make sure that I pass that information along to my students. But uh, with the franchises. Um, Aggressive loan care companies started franchising in the 80s. Uh, in the 90s, you saw the acquisition of smaller firms by the larger firms. They started uh, uh, buying them out, which is a good thing for the smaller companies. And then other service industry companies uh, entered the landscape market by purchasing loan care companies. So that may have been, um, you know, a housekeeping uh, company or a window washing company uh, entered the landscape uh, business by purchasing these uh, lawn care companies. And I had a friend in Atlanta who owned a Christmas decor franchise. Uh, uh, you know, he's no longer doing Christmas lights. He's no longer doing landscaping. Um, but his, I'm not going to tell his name because some of you guys may know it because I know a lot of people are in Georgia will be taking these classes. But I really, really learned a lot from him. And again, that goes back to not everybody knows everything. And I always surround myself with people smarter than me. I do. Uh, I look to hang out with the doctors, the lawyers, the accountants, uh, anybody that's in a different uh, professional uh, 
industry. I like hanging out with them because I learn, you know, um, tricks and, you know, tips on how to, to, you know, to run the business. And then also like hanging out with other horticulture professionals because I'm still going to learn from them. But I learned a lot from this guy. He actually had a Christmas decor franchise. He had a um, U.S. Loans franchise as well. And this guy had never cut grass in his life. He had never hung Christmas lights. He had never done anything. He was a suit and tie guy. And again, he was that, that not necessarily a clipboard builder because he had a lot of employees. But he bought these franchises to get started, and he sold them, you know, five or six years later, and he made he made a he made a hit. I mean, he made a good little chunk of money by doing this, and now he's doing something totally different. But the good thing about the franchise is it's something that you can sell um, at a later date when you when you build the business up. Um, so bad thing is you got to pay royalty fees and all that, but if you're making a ton of money, so what? It's kind of like with taxes. People always ask me about taxes. I'm like, well, good thing is if you got to pay taxes, it means you are making money. So I'll gladly write Uncle Sam that check as long as I have the money to pay for my taxes. The bad thing is when you look at it all on paper, you've done all this business and you're like, not even wrote yourself a paycheck and you're like wow i actually made this much money when your accountant's doing it for you and then you're like well i don't have i don't have twenty dollars in my pocket to go out to eat for lunch i've got to use a credit card um and then you you get a tax bill for you know an ungodly amount um uh, that kind of ticks you off but it is what it is so some franchises and consolidations and here these are the 2014 rank again uh this has probably changed i know valley crest and uh, actually i think it was a brickman group that that merged right so and there's some new name but these were the the 14 ranks and then it compares it to the 13,000 ranks so it's just a couple of years ago uh, but the number of employees where their headquarters are and what their revenue was for 2013. And look at that, $992 million. Now, that is a lot of landscaping. Just think of all the headaches that come with that, right? But a good friend of mine worked for the Brickman Group in Greensboro, went to college with him, undergraduate, great guy. Uh, still get to talk to him every once in a while. And then, uh, but these are your big name, uh, uh, big boys that I like calling them. So, what are some of the benefits to consolidation and or acquisition? Hmm. Well, consolidation means, you know, either they buy you out uh, or you guys merge. Sometimes having two business owners um, run a larger corporation can be good. You can maybe get that vacation that your wife wants you to take her on. Bad thing with us is we work throughout the fun times of the year, you know, the spring all the way up till probably about Christmas, especially in this area. I mean, we're still cutting grass, pine needling, getting everything looking good for the year. So really we only have, you know, a couple bad months and that's January and February. And that's when the kids are in school and you can't go to the beach or anything like that. And usually you're probably pushing snow and we'll have a lecture on snow removal uh, this year as well, which is another favorite topic of mine but something that I will never ever ever do again I've had so much of that that that's the one thing I don't want to do but some benefits of, of selling out you can become an employee of that company you get that big chunk of money up front and you're an employee for so many years or you consolidate and you guys work together and you can start sharing some of the responsibilities but with franchising, again, purchasing power. With our Christmas decor, you know, we were buying it from, uh, you know, the franchise. They had good pricing on the lights and everything. And if we weren't buying it directly from them, uh, some things we had to, we had other vendors that we got a good price discount. But the best thing we had about the Christmas decor franchise was the system implementation. There is absolutely no way we could have started doing holiday lighting or event decorations without learning their system. It would have took us 20 years, if not longer, to, to come up with a system 
of how to do that. Not only pricing it, but the purchasing of it, the storing of the lights, the installation of it, the takedown methods. It was so perfected by the guys in Texas that you, you couldn't have gotten into it without, without buying the franchise. What they taught us in that week-long school or those three or four days that we went to uh, when we purchased the franchise, would have, like I said, took us 20 years, 20 years. And, and I really thank, uh, really thank Blake and them down in Texas. We, we had a good time uh, having that franchise for 10 years. And, you know, it was just time for us to move on. Uh, we just didn't renew. Um, you know, my dad got into the strawberries and I... Uh, you know, it was in the army at this time, so we kind of just let that uh, segment of our business go. Uh, you can reduce overlapping of employees and equipment, and that is another good thing that we had with the Christmas Decor franchise. We were able to keep, because we had 30 employees at one time, we were able to keep most of them throughout the winter by installing Christmas lights. And the ones that weren't doing the lights, those are the ones, you know, going in and doing some winter pruning and doing the uh, pine needling and stuff and actually um, making the properties look really nice uh, for the Christmas season. And the best thing about, probably the, the best thing about our Christmas decor franchise, we got a lot of new customers uh, for our landscape business by installing lights for people. People really weren't hiring Elite Landscape Service to do landscape work until they knew it was us that was doing the Christmas light. So we'd go and decorate their house for Christmas, give them the card for Elite Landscape. Next thing you know, we were cutting their lawns, doing their fertilizing, doing the whole the whole nine yards for them, doing that landscape management plan for them. And management training. So if you do get uh, a franchise uh, or consolidate, one of the bigger guys buys you out or something like that, and you get the management training, uh, of how they want things run and kind of the management training and system implementation kind of go hand in hand. And I apologize if I keep looking at my watch. I am trying to keep these lectures around an hour, uh, a little less, and give you guys time enough to do the uh, the 10 question quiz that'll be on the uh, the Moodle site uh, once you uh, watch the lectures. But commercial landscapes, we have shopping centers, uh, apartment complexes, uh, HOAs, homeowner associations. Another thing that I do not want to ever work for again is an HOA. And then businesses, and then actually working for property management firms. And probably the two, uh, the two last ones there is probably, I think, the easiest to work for. I like working for businesses, especially working directly for the business owner. They want their properties or their businesses to look good, so you're dealing one-on-one -on -one with that business owner. And even property management firms who, who are looking after properties for other people. And these are usually real estate companies. Usually the property management firms, they've got your back. Um, you know, it's a dollar thing for them. So they're the ones that are saying, yes, you know, you're supposed to cut the grass 32 times a year or 36 times a year, whatever the contract is. And you're supposed to pine needle once or twice a year, all that based on the contract. So they, they've kind of got your back. But at least from my experience, they've had it. HOAs, dealing with the homeowners, and these homeowners that are probably, they go and they take their little master gardener course or they watch that television show on Saturday morning and, you know, you show up next week to work. They are the experts more so than you'll ever be. So I just don't like dealing with them. Uh, apartment complexes, you know, it just depends. Mm, had some bad, bad experiences with, uh, with those. Um, Commercial landscape still, you know, there's over 19,000 golf courses in the U.S. serving 26 to 35 million golfers. Uh, and then even one third of the cemeteries out there contract landscape management services. And from what I understand with that, it's pretty much, uh, um, you know, the cemeteries are being bought out uh, by one company. And, you know, they're actually um, uh using the same landscape management company, like one of the big guys to, to manage it for them uh, or do the, do their type of work, not the type of grass cutting business I want to be in. I could just imagine, um, having a weed eat, had to weed eat around all those headstones, not what I want to do for a living. 
public landscapes. We have parks, playgrounds, schools, highways, um, highway mowing. Um, you know, could uh, could be a good opportunity for you, especially if you have the company in your wife's name. Uh, you know, being a woman-owned uh, business would would help for that. You have national and local government properties, and then you have military. And just think about all the grass. I mean, I'm you know every every I'm still Army Reserve. I mean, every weekend uh, we have drill. You know, for not the reserve center, we we we're going to Fort Gordon, Georgia. I'm going to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I'm going to Camp Shelby, Mississippi. I'm somewhere that's got a ton of grass to cut. And uh, I was even at Fort Knox back in. Uh, 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 end of January, February, and um, I seen uh, the Brickman group up there um, cutting uh, at Fort Knox. So that was good seeing um, something familiar being away from home for those few weeks. Technology. We have reliable automated equipment. We have a lot of good stuff to use, not only in the lawn care business and, and mowing business, but any aspect of horticulture that we're going at. We have low cost and effective pesticides. And I love teaching the integrated pest management plan. Not every situation um, needs the use of a pesticide. There's other ways to take care of that. And that is one way that we are a professional. We are the the professional who is providing a science to our clients and we're not having to use a pesticide. And then we have university research and we have private industry research. You know, the chemical companies are always giving us this information. We have so much information available to us as horticulture professionals and landscapers um, that, uh, you know, again, we're learning every single day. Um, legislative influence. You know, we need to be ecologically friendly. And I've always felt that we have. Uh, I felt like we've always been ecologically friendly. We have a, a desire and a love for the outdoors, for plants, for, for trees, I mean, turf grass. We, we do that because we love it. Um, sustainable, I don't like that word. Um, try not to use it. We uh, try not to, it's kind of like organic. It's just one of those things that, you know, we could go on and on and on about that. Do I think we could incorporate? Yes, we, we, we incorporate sustainability every day uh, in our businesses. That's, that's what we do. I felt like people that are in agriculture and horticulture, We've been using sustainable practices, so why do we need this word that people come up with uh, for it? Um, but when they look at sustainability, one of the, the key components of sustainability is, is being able to sustain your business. Are you making money? And there's guys out there who are not. So how can you be sustainable if you're not making money? So again, that can open up a can of worms and we're not going to do that best management practices you know the irrigation board has a great um, uh, program for best management practices i actually do a a, a two-hour lecture for them on best management practices integrated pest management again we're we're handling a pest situation without the use of pesticides by incorporating a um, uh, you know, incorporating a another pest that would eat the the pest. It's it, that's that is a fun science to um, uh, to study. And then we have noise and air quality, uh, and we all see what's going on in California. You know, you can't use back to back blowers uh, except between certain times of day. Some of them have even banned them totally. So I can see my guys out there sweeping off sidewalks where we've run a weed eater. So, um, you know, we're always going to have to deal with issues like this. Uh, future landscape maintenance. Uh, again, there's that word maintenance, but has and will continue to have the least capital intensive and simplest requirements for entry into the business in all of horticulture. We're going to see it every day. I swear, it seems like I see a new landscape uh, company every single day. 
and it may just be the guy with the pickup truck that doesn't have his logo on it, but he's got a brand new shiny mower on the back and he's got that weed eater rack and blower rack hanging on it and he is in business. He is in business. And the one thing that it's kind of breaks my heart um, is having to see firefighters and police officers and, and paramedics seeing those guys have to cut grass to make ends meet. Those are three of the biggest heroes in our society that they're not making enough money to sustain their household, that they're having to cut grass on their days off. Uh, it's a shame they have to do that. They should be paid uh, uh, higher than anybody. And in, in my opinion, the police, the firefighters, the paramedics, and, and the, 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 the teachers in elementary school and high schools and middle schools, those, you know, those are our, our four true heroes on the civilian side. And I love each and every one of them. And it breaks my heart that they have to cut grass to make ends meet. Um, and then they're kind of stepping on our toes who are doing it full time. So there's there's mixed emotions there. I, I know why they're having to do it, but they, they should be making enough money that they shouldn't have to do it. When they risk their lives every day, when they get a day off, they should be able to enjoy it. They shouldn't have to be out there fighting for work uh, with us. But we're going to see it every every day. We're going to see that new guy get into business. When somebody gets laid off from from the factory, what do they do? They start cutting grass because all they got to do is have a credit card. All I got to do is have most of them have a pickup truck. They get started so easily. Um, firms that once started out just mowing have added services to their businesses. What are some of these services? Um, you know, design and installation, irrigation, lawn care, and then the holiday decorations. Um, the holiday decoration used to see it big time around here. It's kind of slowed down a little bit, and I guess that was due to uh, the recession and stuff. But, uh, um, you know, I know several guys that started out cutting grass that went strictly irrigation. So um, you'll see a lot of that happen. Uh, I love landscape design. I love the profession of landscape architecture. Uh, I love doing installations. Um Commercial and residential. You know, we used to do the O'Reilly's. We, we've been all over the southeast um, uh, doing the uh, landscape and irrigation for the O'Reilly's auto parts store. We did it for Creative Structures uh, out of Knoxville. Uh, pretty much every store they built, we we got the landscape on it. Um, really enjoyed that. Sustainable has become a common term used by the landscape industry. Again, don't really want to touch on that. That's um, a can of worms. Uh, what are some issues faced by landscape management firms? Pesticides. You know, people are always going to freak out when they see you spraying the lawns. Um, they're always going to worry about our emission levels, noise limitations, the hours of operations, labor supply. Again, it's hard to find good help. There's even communities and, and, and uh, municipalities that you can only use the blower between certain hours of the day because they don't want the noise limitation. And then the emissions levels, we're having to use different um, types of weed eaters and blowers that, that reduce the emissions. And I can kind of see that point, but um, it's something that hurts us as business owners. And then with the pesticides, it's always a touchy issue with, with people. Uh, minimum wage, you know, it's going to probably increase, uh, you know, you know, over and over again within our uh, within our careers. Health care, you know, if you have a full time employee now, you have to provide health care. And then immigration, you know, if it wasn't for the Hispanic labor force, I don't see how we could have done it, and see how most of the landscape companies can do it. They have been a great source. Uh, of labor for us in many, many companies. Um, just something I threw in here from the textbook. Politicians, tree huggers, and the public need to change their view of the landscape industry as a water-wasting, energy-consuming, chemically dependent, environmentally polluting, ecologically unsound, lazy, careless, unimaginative child killers. And that's kind of how some of these people see us. So uh, I probably should have took this out. So we'll, uh, we'll disregard that. 
Again, labor, the largest expense for most of us. Uh, we have had a shortage of labor, labor. That's why we use H2B, H2A, B meaning uh, uh, for business, A meaning for agriculture. And these are, you know, Hispanic um, uh, people that, that, that come over and help. Um, agriculture would be like your tobacco farmers, your strawberry farmers, things of that nature. And then your H2B workers would be the ones working for the landscape companies uh, and possibly even construction companies. Um, number of graduates increasing from two and year uh, four year colleges uh, has been increasing. The wages and benefits increase uh, to attract and retain employees, and that's what we got to do. We have got to let our clients know that we charge a premium price so that we can maintain some of the best help. Um, I've never understood this philosophy. People want to pay you little or nothing to do the best job ever, and it's just something that, that has driven me crazy. And I've always had the philosophy that, yeah, sometimes you need to fire your clients just like you fire your employees. There's just some people you cannot work for. And then landscape companies, we, we often compete with um, the construction industry for, for, good, for good employees. Uh, and construction typically can pay a little bit more. Um, so you'll have a lot of guys leave you for that, especially within the Hispanic force. Uh, we're always going to be dealing with fuel wars uh, and even housing we uh, we can track growth on an eight to nine month delay behind the construction industry so when the housing boom starts we're about eight to nine months behind it and then when it slows down we've got about eight or nine months of work uh, left but the bad thing about working for builders is that we're on the tail end of the house being completed so typically either the homeowner or the builders definitely kind of running low on funds by the time they hire us uh, water fresh water used annually golf courses use about 1.5 landscapes use about 2.9 percent of fresh water and then irrigation components and systems um, have roughly 800 million dollars in sales and then where there is uh, a chance to use wastewater uh, for non-food land. I know the town of Cary here in North Carolina has, um, you know, the pink pipe in the ground where they're actually treating wastewater and using it for irrigation. So that is, um, uh, that is one way that we can be sustainable uh, and actually uh, um, help out with saving water. Again, professionalism, guys, marketing, it's my favorite thing to do as a business owner. I love to brag on myself and, you know, something as simple as designing a new business card. I just, I just enjoy doing it. I love doing it. And then we must incorporate the sustainable practices or at least um, um, study them and, and, and kind of incorporate what we can for them, for our business. Uh, good horticulturalists must become good business people. The seasonal nature of the industry, uh, uh, it is hard on us. We have undercapitalization at times. Our profit margins can be uh, up and down. The people that we have to deal with based on clients and employees and then capital management. And then business failure cannot be ignored. I mean, it's going to happen. Like I said earlier, my accountant told me you can run two years on negative cash flow, but at the end of that two years, it's going to slap you in the face and you're, you're out of business. Landscape management industry, there's roughly between 50 and 145,000 companies. I'm sure that number is well over 145,000 now, but probably only 50 are still about reporting income and actually paying taxes on the work that they do. And there is a combined revenue between 40 and 60 billion. It's an industry of small companies. Most generate less than 200,000. Most have just one to three employees year round and only the uh, about 15% of the market is held by the larger companies. I mean, this is truly a mom and pop industry uh, within the landscape management uh, industry. Uh, residentials are bread and butter and we need to focus on the specialty. If you find that specialty niche, uh, that's where you're, where you're going to make your money. And I swear, I think my, my niche was, was the $20 yards that we do, you know, five an hour and we're making a hundred bucks an hour. Education, 
four-year universities offer landscape degrees but haven't increased in the past 20 years but there are numerous one and two-year programs offered nationally and if you make a horticulture mistake you lose the crop but if you make a business mistake you can lose the farm good quote from the book uh, employment opportunities there's always continued growth especially if you're uh, uh, working for a company if you're the business owner um, you know you're pretty much going to stick with your own company but if you're if you're a landscape contractor working for a larger company you've always got room to grow within that company or you know outside the company with with bigger firms uh, some student examples um, you know we've had a lot of students graduate the program start their own business become very successful and we've had a lot of students go on and get all the way up to their master's degree um, we have a lot of students become ag agents high school ag teachers so we, we've got so so many uh, of our students um, out there in the work uh, workforce now keeping up continuing education things like we're doing right now uh, just being a member of um, you know the, the landscape organizations that are out there having a self library uh, I used to collect all the uh, landscape architecture magazines that I came um, all the landscape contractor magazines I had a nice little library that I can do it but now it's don't have to do that so much because uh, because of the internet and then staying afloat um, with new trends and ideas uh, and being a part of these professional associations I like doing that um, and that way you get to meet people and and uh, like I said you learn something every day in this business and that concludes it so we were I think close to an hour on this there will be a 10 question quiz on Moodle uh, for you to answer and as soon as you get that done I usually check every night and I'll email the proofs of attendance thanks and I'll see you guys in the next lecture